Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Abby. I work in the Society and Business Lab, and I'm thrilled to welcome all of you guys today to the first Lunch and Learn of the Year. The Society and Business Lab is a center within Marshall, and we are devoted to using business models to save the world and to supporting students like you who are interested in doing the same. So we have lots of programming for faculty, staff, undergraduates, graduate students. This Lunch and Learn today is part of an ongoing series. We have one once a month throughout the academic year. And I hope that you saw some of the flyers that were circulating about it. In addition, we have lots of different programs and resources for all of you guys. So I hope that you'll take the time to check out our website. Again, Society and Business Lab SVL. So that's marshall.usc.edu slash SVL. <laughs> I'd like to introduce two of our graduate fellows who will help us welcome Brian today. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Todd Benchuf, and I have the exciting opportunity to introduce us to uh, Brian Sturgis. He's the president, speaking of checking out websites, uh, he's the president of causecast.org. Uh, it's an exciting interactive community where uh, individuals and uh, individuals, leaders, brands, and also celebrities can all get together to uh, change the world. Hi there, and my name is Molly Larson. I'm also um, one of the graduate students that's a fellow here. Um, so Brian has worked um, as a partner with Sean Fanning from Napster and um, producer, producer, excuse me, Michael Beinhorn, who um, worked with Corn, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, informing non-records. And that's one of the first labels to start the 360 degree model. Um, for artists, and then from 2000 to 2004, Brian was the president of Elementary Records, um, a label that was owned by Corn and its management company, The Firm. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Well, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was uh, interesting um, when I was approached to to speak. Uh, you know, I've, I've only uh, when I used to work in the music industry, I, I taught a couple classes for the. NYU uh, music school there in terms of business and my background in terms of what I did what I did in the music industry and all of a sudden I find myself living in LA running a you know a, a website that supports nonprofits and leaders and activists and causes and I'm like how did I how did I get from there to here you know I was busy you know you know like uh, on traveling the world and you know with rock, with rock and roll but um, I wanted to um, just to give you a little bit of uh, background about myself, a little bit more, um, I uh, come from a, a back, um, my background is one where I went to, a, I grew up in, a, in a New England around different, within, in, within the boarding school structure. So it was like, I was very much, uh, very much very, very claustrophobic in regards to uh, the environment that, the, that my education was in. It was very much for, Hyper intelligent people that were just there to study, very in, you know, eight people, ten people in a class, uh, and you know, I, I always felt that there was just a little bit, I don't know, I just felt that there was something more to learn about the le about the world that wasn't just like in the classroom and being geared towards an Ivy League education. So uh, I went to when I went to New York University, I actually dropped out because I got a job to be. Uh, the assistant agent to Guns N' Roses at 19. <laughs> and it was really interesting how that happened because it was like, you know, the, the, I, I, my, uh, my friend who I lived in the building in New York City was like, my dad wants to meet you. He was Guns N' Roses agent. He also represented Paul McCartney. He just left this big agency called ICM, right? And ICM was this like, like I mean, they represented everybody in the music industry. So he's like, all right, so uh, my daughter tells me you want to work for me. Why? And I had no idea that this was being set up. So I was just like, oh, uh, well, I'm into communications, and uh, you know I didn't know what I wanted to kind of do. And where B was, you know, just I was just starting in college, and, and uh, was just trying to figure things out. So what turned out to be, you know, just sort of of an impromptu meeting turned out to be uh, traveling uh, the world at 19 with the band uh, and acting as the assistant agent to uh, Alex Cochin, who was the band's agent. His job was to actually go with the band and do what's called settlement. And settlement would be like, you know, you go over the contract in the back room, there'd be about a uh, hundred thousand, half a million dollars in cash from the door. There'd be the tour manager there with a suitcase attached to it with a handcuff. And he used to go over the contract, and he used to go back and forth and, and argue about what was, uh, who was paying for towels that night or who the, what the promoter was supposed to pay for. And that was, this was something called settlement. So what's interesting about this, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this is my life is filled with real life weird experiences in 
dealing with business. In the, in the, least, in the places I least expected it. You know, like, you know, here I am on the road with Guns N' Roses at 19. I was supposed to be, you know, I guess in some college, you know, studying. And here I am getting a really hard, you know, education in terms of what went into the agency model and music, what went into the, you know, how promoters work, how the managers work with bands, how the record companies work. So all of a sudden I started learning about how the music industry started to work. And that's how I got into that, into that business. Um, and as part of my history, uh, which sort of led me to here to uh, Causecast was um, at, uh, a, a long story short, I went back to NYU to finish my degree uh, after seven years, um, which was interesting because I'm sitting in class and people are going around, so where'd you go to high school? Tell us about your story. And I'm like, here I'm 29 years old going, well, uh, <laughs> I was on the road with Guns N' Roses and Nine Inch Nails and Paul McCartney and so everyone else told me, they're like, hey. <laughs> um, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Atari, and they're talking about, uh, you know, other things. But anyway, um, I, you know, I got a call at that moment, like, the minute I graduated, I got a call from the actual lead singer of Korn, a guy named Jonathan Davis, and uh, Jeff Quantance, who is a, runs a company called The Firm. Now, The Firm, at this point, were becoming the largest entertainment company in all of Hollywood. So they were managing not only Korn, but Limp, at the time, Limp Bizkit, uh, the Dixie Chicks, Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Scorsese, they just bought out Michael Owitz's company. Um, took on the debt to be able to inherit a lot of his managers and clients. So all of a sudden they're like, we need somebody in the East Coast. We want you to run elementary records and you know do, do East Coast operations and do A&R for this new label we're building. So it was like, we want to do this with you. We're like, okay. Um, and literally, I was like, I'm going to take some time off. I just needed a month. So I traveled to, to Costa Rica and just a little backpacking. And the day I, and sort of the week I got back, um, it was September 9th. 2001, and it was the video, MTV Video Music Awards, and we were out with, you know, I was having dinner with the band Stained in Lincoln Park, and they were performing at the show, and we all went out, it was really late, and I think it was like, the whole next day, the September 10th, everything was radically hungover, um, <laughs> and, but I remember on September 11th, the office where I ran, uh, you know, elementary in the firm, which was where I had a very large loft in downtown Tribeca. I don't know how many people you've been to New York City or just sort of know the downtown area. Um, but again, it was uh, that morning, uh, woke up, and that was, if you saw the video of the first plane hitting the building, that was my block. So, um, so this was south of Canal Street. It was, uh, we were at Church and Walker, where we lived, and I woke up because I heard the plane overhead and it was just and it just shook the entire the entire building and I remember going out with my with my, my uh, with my roommate at the time who who was the we had a video camera and we were watching this plane he's like let's go down there. So what turned out to be just like oh this is just a plane hitting the building, we didn't know what was happening, turned into what became a series of events which led me to think about how I was using my talents and what I was doing in the world. Um, make a, you know again, you know, being three blocks away when the first building collapsed and seeing, you know, people dying and, and, and hearing that, and uh, you know, I still get this is right. I get, I'm getting chills just talking about it. It was um, uh, a very emotional and tough thing to deal with. And then after that, we were able to because I still had power and water after after the buildings collapsed. Martial law was declared. I don't know. Certain people don't know certain things. So martial law was declared south of Canal Street. If you didn't have an ID, you couldn't walk around. So again, everyone in the neighborhood left, except a few people. So we would actually go to some of the local businesses and just try to keep them and keep them going. So we went into this, this bar called Puffy's Tavern, and there's the entire, this is like a few days later, like three days later, the entire Chicago Fire Department are in the bar. And we're like the only New Yorkers. So I was like, I'm buying all you guys drinks because you guys drove your truck out from Chicago to be here to help rescue your brothers. And what I was doing at the time was snuffing with the Red Cross, uh, was delivering food to different triages. So the Stuyvesant School was called First Triage, the American Se Express Building was called the Second Triage, and then there was Ground Zero. So what we would do is we'd go back and forth from Stuyvesant School and set up a food triage here, and then go between, in through whatever was the remain, through all this like this debris, and forming these food triages next to the morgues and where the, where the doctors were working. And all everybody wanted was coffee. I had pre-made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, no one wanted that. I had socks for the firefighters, nobody wanted that. It was really just coffee, 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 because all they wanted to do was stay awake to find 
um, you know, their, their, their brothers. So um, I kept passing out because of the air. I had one mask. The mask was later, we found, was only good for, for 30 minutes. That was what I, what I used for a week to volunteer. Um, and at a certain point, and after that, I had to leave. My father had a stroke, so you just to say it was like a really tough, like, you know, two weeks for me personally. Um, and it, and it, what was interesting is because it gave me the time to reflect on what I was doing. And right after all this sort of happened, I had the opportunity to, you know, after working with Michael and Sean Fanning for about a year, um, and starting Non Records and building this new, this new model for artists, um, and, you know, I, I took over the, the uh, one of the clients I signed was, uh, was the family of Aaliyah. I don't know if you already know Aaliyah, who died in a plane crash. So the family came to me and said, listen, we're just sort of getting out of the, you know, this, this a place of, you know, where we're, we have it focused on the, of, the, of the business. There's all these bootleggers running around. There's no website. There's, there's no uh, infrastructure. We want you to, to sort of set things up and have all the money benefit the Aaliyah Memorial Fund. And I was like, oh, what's a memorial fund? Like, I heard about it, but I didn't know anything about philanthropy. I didn't know anything about 501c3s. I didn't know anything about charities, really. I was just like, okay. So I started, you know, working with them, sort of just, you know, doing some, some deals. And, and, and what was interesting is that the, 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 uh, Aaliyah's mother, uh, Diane Houghton, had a trap of Aaliyah singing at 16 years old. And we had the rights to put it out. So what I did was like, hey, what if we, at the time, what if we released this as a, as a ringtone? Okay, I mean, ringtones were kind of big at the time, and they were able to charge three ninety nine for a ringtone, where they were selling songs for ninety nine cents. So, you know, it was interesting. You could actually sell a lot more ringtones, make a lot more money, and it was interesting. It was more money for less less song, which was ironic. And of course, it was being throughout all the carriers. So, what happened was that we released, we did this this deal. It was the first time ever that a deceased artist had an unreleased track released as a ringtone. So the, pre the press picked up on it, and it was pretty. It was pretty cool how that happened, and we, we, we probably made about, for the foundation, about close to $600,000 from a ringtone, right? Not even a song, but it was like, wow, look at all the, what, what we can really do to, you know, if you think about content, you're thinking about assets, and how you can actually apply these to sort of like doing good in the world. We're like, oh my God, wow, what else can we do? So I'm like, so yeah, I see Jay-Z, I'm like, hey Jay, what's going on, man? And we're talking, and, he, and people would see me, they'd be like, oh, because I represented Aaliyah and Aaliyah's family, and they were very close to her, so I'm kind of like the Grim Reaper, unfortunately. Like, and they're like, oh, it's you. But, I mean, they liked me, and they liked Aaliyah, but it was very tough for them, because it was, they loved her so much. Uh, so I was like, Jay, we really, and you really need your help, what, can you do a song for Aaliyah? And he's like, whatever you need. So he, Jay-Z does a song for the Aaliyah Memorial Fund. And you can get it online. It's actually free. It's, it's up. I'll uh, I'll uh, um, I'll email you where you can get the, the link for it. Um, but uh, there was it, again. It was like then this. We were going to sell it online. We we're going to actually you know get all the profits from the to the to the charity. And then what happened was one of the major record labels said, um, uh, "No, you're using a sample, and we're not going to give you clearance unless you pay for it." I'm not going to say who the major record company was, but this is sort of the thinking. At the time, I think it was like file trading was bad, bad. They were looking at sort of their, how they were losing a lot of money. And I'm like, but this is for charity. They're like, that does, they don't, I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't concern us. Well, we don't care what it's for. You're, you're, you need to pay for using that sample and we want, you know, $100,000, I think it was the amount, which was ludicrous, which was like just, and, and I, didn't, I didn't want to go back to Jay and go, can you redo the song? You know, because it was really a big part of the, it was a really big part of the song. So anyway, it didn't, we, so basically I just fit, I, what I did though is I said, uh, I put it out there on the internet for free, and basically it was like, if people want to make a donation, they can. And we did raise money. People were actually, uh, the Leah's community were very responsive, and they would give a dollar. We would get checks from people in prisons. We would actually get che checks from kids for like, you know, like literally a dollar seventy-five. And they're like, this is all the money I could spare. I mean, we, these boxes came. And all of a sudden, I started realizing that there's, there's, there's this thing out there that people kind of want to tap into. And especially what was interesting was the, the prisoners. Prisoners of jails who loved Aaliyah, which was interesting, because they would write so many letters uh, to Aaliyah's family, feeling, talking about sympathy, I mean, and, and, like in how, and how they were just sort of um, reaching out to the family. So, um, in, so I wanted to give you a little bit about that background of how I got here, right, which is that uh, that have to run a technology company, costcast.org, which is, you know, it does three things. And the last thing I want to do is like come here and kind of talk specifically about 
um, you know, what I think is going to work, because what I think is going to work, probably not going to work. And what I tell you is going to work, and what I have all planned out, and what our business, all our MBAs have, and all that stuff, that model will change in three to six months. I'll guarantee you that. What we started with Costcast, how the business model was built, and how the mills, like millions of dollars that we put into the company was at right now, it's nowhere close to what, like, what we perceived was. And we had some of the smartest people working on this project. Some of the best advisors in technology. My partner, the CEO, and founder, one of the, one of the, the founders, uh, you know, we had a, we had a, the, the founding, you know, Ryan Scott is the, he invented the double opt-in email process. So every time you actually want to click to get an email, you get an email back going, you sure you want that email? That's him. And he kept it open. And the reason why he did that was because he wanted to keep, he wanted to have competition. He wanted, he, he believed that competition was good for, for the industry. And he started what was be, what would be uh, the company called, known as Net Creations, which was the first ethical email marketing company. And he started with no VC, with two people, and it bloomed up to like 150 people within about two years. Uh, it was doing $50 million a year, and in 2000, sold it for an all-cash deal. And 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 because he believed that email marketing could be ethical, even though everyone else was saying, no, no, you should spam. Spam is it, these are big companies going like double click, going no, no, you're going to spam, or you know, or, or bigger, the bigger, you know, that that spam spam was sort of going to be the actual what was going to be a standard model in the industry. And that was like, he was like, he said he, he's gonna fight against that and even, even uh, was able to um, lobby for laws to, to, to make sure that there was an, the anti-spamming law he was involved with helping getting that, getting that passed in, into the government. So he keeps this patent open for everybody to use now. So what Ryan, when I met Ryan, um, it was ironic, I was actually on my way to India. Um, I was actually moving to India. I was actually going to take a trip around the world for about a year, uh, a one-way ticket. My friends shipped in to uh, buy me a ticket. I had some money. I was like, I was going to be, I was going to travel to India, uh, Nepal, Cambodia. I was going to teach, um, and it was like the last. I never really got to experience the world that way. And I figured, what better time? You know, I've I've, I've had some success in life and. I'm going to take some. I'm just going to take some time and blog about it and put and report back. And um, the 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 week before I was supposed to leave, I came to LA to speak at a conference for a company I was advising called Textango, who had a patent on selling music using cell phone billing. So and that got me beginning to think: How can we use new technologies to actually help nonprofits and charities? And you know, how do we solve the problem of giving online that that uh, has been so arduous with credit cards and getting people engaged online. You know, it's such a big thing from like, hey, here's this video of somebody that needs help and then all of a sudden what's the percentage of people that are actually contributing and why is it so low? Like what's this what's the what's the what's the big part? You're seeing something and you're inspired and all of a sudden there's like, what are these barriers to entry? Why what you know like so I was trying to you know to work on I was like beginning to think like how do we how do you tap how do you really capture people immediately? How do you do it in a way that might not require mom, can I borrow your credit card for to give five dollars for this child in, in Africa. There's got to be a better way to approach it. So again, so Ryan was like, he he realized after you know trying to make a, and he's on the board of you know some he's a big philanthropist on the board of a lot of charities. He realized the charities were like five years behind the times. So, I mean, they really were like their websites were were um, were slow and 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 janky. Uh, you couldn't really know. You didn't know where your donation was going. Like the design was terrible, and why should people that are in the nonprofit space actually have to be, um, uh, you know, sort of experts in technology? They shouldn't. They should be. More, they should be focusing on what they do. So the idea of cost guess is like, what if we actually had all these charities in one place, and people can find out about them, and then people can make donations very easily, and the charities can actually they can have their own site, and if you wanted to really learn more and stuff. But what about a platform that was able to not only do, to do three things? One to be able to pull content from, from around the world, put it in one place, uh, and make, whether it's aggregating that content or doing original content with the nonprofits or with the celebrities or leaders, putting it in one place, finding an easy way to then take action from that content, right? So whether it's text, video, um, cost cast developed, and I'll, um, I'll be able to, I wish the, I could show you the, the new beta device site, but I can't right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the video player, the new one that we've developed, you'll be able to donate from, you'll be able to learn more, the nonprofits can program that, the leaders can program that. Um, and 
you know, really being able to make that division between inspiration and action much tighter. And that was, that's, that's, was part of our goal. It's the second part of what Coscast does is a social network. And being a social network, we feel, and it's like, well, why are you doing, why are you doing a social network? It's like, I've got a million, there's MySpace and there's Facebook, and you know, Facebook just passed 300 million users and is now cash positive. It's fabulously successful, which is wonderful because for the first time in history in the internet, social networking has actually passed pornography as the number one traffic <laughs> and what, what people are looking for. And actually, that's a huge thing because for a long time, that was 75% of what people were searching for on the internet. So now all of a sudden we have the shift, the paradigm shift, which is actually probably why I'm even standing here in this class with people that people have been putting together because there's a shift to what's happening in the world. I think we're kind of starting to see, especially with the internet, that it's like nothing, things aren't okay. That you can get your, you know, you can get your degree and you can kind of live your life and have your house and uh, you'll be protected. I think we've seen from the, from the financial crisis and politicians, there's this thing in the world that's happening and that nobody is really kind of safe and that leaves us very scared leaves us very worried about, well, you know, no matter what you do, you know, wow, change is such a weird thing, such a, such a strange thing. I just feel if I have this, you know, if I get this done, I'll, I'll achieve happiness. If I have this degree or this job or this, you know, kids, or, and I have this, what is, what's been, you know, kind of our, the American dream, which was sort of sold to, I think, my parents' generation, that didn't work out too well either, you know? And so this leads us to why businesses why people that actually go, hey, you can actually do well and do well for the world. So Ryan had this concept of, of CauseCast uh, and it, it, how it started and it, it was what it started and what the screenshots he showed me before I went on my trip to India compelled me to go back home and, you know, and, and tell my uh, Jewish grandparents instead of Varanasi I was going to Venice. Um, and, you know, they're like, at least it's not India, you know, so, uh, you know, oh, God. Um, so, so, okay, so if you're going to move away to another country, just tell them, you know, like, you're, you're going to some third world country, then move to, like, L.A., and you'll be okay. Um, but, but again, the, it was uh, what started as four people, with, it, it, you know, to building Coscast has now turned into an operation of domain directly at any point in, uh, of time. You're looking around 60 to 70 people are working on Coscast. Um, we have about, you know, 18, soon to be 19 or 20 full-time employees. There's an army of about 25 interns that work at any given time at the company. There are PR firm lawyers. We are, we have, we have uh, not taken a cent of VC, venture capital, for you know, the MBAs. That, you don't know that, you probably should go to the other school. Um, but uh, there's some journalism students here, I heard. Uh, but, the uh, no VC, we haven't taken any VC, and, we're, and, and our models evolved where we're actually going to be profitable. So we're like, wow, how did you do that? How did you actually, like, it's a technology company that, especially a website that's not getting a ton of traffic. I mean, we're, it's, it's good, it's building, um, but again, we're not blowing the socks up because it's like, wow, who's looking for cause content? You know, it's like, that's a little, wait, what are you talking about? I want entertainment, I want celebrity stuff, I want. You know, I'm like in news, like there's, there's financial crises and there's, there's issues with healthcare and there's politicians lying and like all this Kanye getting on stage with me, you know, and like, <laughs> like I mean, well, why would I want to go on the cause cast, you know? So again, what started to happen was that when we started putting it out there and people were like, you know what, I, this is interesting. Like, what if you did, what if you actually, instead of being self righteous, you actually started doing things in a way which started talking about things and had, creating a dialogue, all right? What if you actually had a business? That actually, instead of saying no, you're wrong, you actually need to, uh, you know, you need to uh, be engaged. Or, you know, I think it was a very interesting. So I don't. You guys should teach this. There's a, there was National Lampoon put out a magazine, and it was there was a gun to this dog's head, and I said, if you do not buy this magazine, this dog will die. All right. And the magazine sales for National Lampoon for that magazine shot up seventy percent for that one issue. All right. I use that analogy because I don't want to guilt you into actually making a donation going, if you don't donate $5, this kid is dead. Because what's just happened is that I've just lost, I've lost a donor that's associated with the brand of the charity. So we're looking out for the charity. So we provide strategic, we, we provide online strategy for whether it's celebrities like, you know, like Jenny, Jenny McCarthy and like Matthew Modine and, and um, uh, the Huffington Post and Ariana Huffington to, you know, um, uh, Maggie Q and to, to, to real life activists in the world like Aaron Cohen who rescues underage sex slaves 
uh, and he has a book on, a book out now called Slave Hunter. Uh, to Pat Pajajo, who's, who's CNN's hero of the year, he's 13 years old, battling leukemia, and started getting in his car with his mom, going door to door to sign up people to be bone marrow donors. Where do you find these people? It's like, wow. It's like, so all of a sudden, this is where the idea of cost cuts started really getting exciting. So um, I'm going to play you a little, just right now, a little video from that Jenny McCarthy did for us when we first launched at uh, what was called TechCrunch 50, which actually just had, which is at an anniversary. So this is a uh, real quick, uh, is there sound? I hope so. Nope. No sound. All right. Who here knows how to work the sound? Will you come show me? All right. Well, yeah, um, come on up. So anyway, Jenny, if anybody, does anyone know about Jenny McCarthy? Just get it. Does anybody know about Jenny McCarthy's uh, nonprofit? Do you know what she's involved with in general? Autism. Autism. How do you guys know that? She's been on Okay, and she talks about that. Right, this is how she recovered her child from autism. But yet, at the same time, a lot of a lot of uh, you know a lot of people don't they don't think that she's you know she's uh, she's right. They believe that you know the whole the whole uh, um, the issue with uh, with vaccinations is the debate is not really a debate. <coughs> you know, um, you have even people like Amanda Peet coming out going supporting the vaccination industry, um, but yet she's saying, "Hey, my, we recovered we recovered uh, my son from from autism. So how is this possible?" So basically, we wanted to put we had we wanted to have a, a place where this debate can exist online. We're not trying to take sides. We're actually telling we want people to tell their story. So, um, so in an, in a nutshell, what we did was when we when we started building out the, you know, the cost cast business model, it was like how do we look? How does an internet company survive today? Like how do we how do we actually you know how do we look at what we're doing to uh, to have a viable you know valuable company? So um, they're coming to help us out. Okay, no, no worries. It's um, but so. Talking about you know the, the existing business business models and whether or not Costcast is going to be sustainable. You know we when we first built the model out, you know we believed that it was going to be you know sustainable, but all of a sudden it changed. And how it changed was that people, companies, brands, uh, celebrities, um, you know, uh, foundations started coming to us and going, "Wow, you guys are doing this in the right the right way." We actually um, we worked with uh, with. Um, the Office of Public Engagement at the White House. So Ryan and I flew out to the White House a couple times right after Obama took office, and they're like, "Listen, we're coming to you because we're going. Hey, we need. You know, it's like you guys are the industry. You guys go do it. We can't tell you what to do. We don't even want to tell you what to do. You guys take initiative." So what Coscast did was that we, when the United was, United We Serve was announced, what did we do? We didn't get on a phone and we talked. We, what we did was we built two different sub websites of Coscast. One was called UnitedWeServe.us. Which provided just do-it-yourself opportunity. It was very wasn't it, it, it didn't take a lot of time. Didn't make a ton of resources. But we built all these do-it-yourself opportunities. How people can get involved locally in their community. And then the second thing we did was built, the, was built a site called the Volunteer, which is actually you put in your email address just to get volunteer opportunities, and you have the opportunity to getting free tickets. And all of a sudden, all these bands started to come on board. Blink 182, Owl City, Lincoln Park, Tool. All of a sudden, they're like, hey, we'll give you tickets to our shows. Yeah, sure. You know, all just to get volunteer opportunities. I'm not saying you have to volunteer. I think that's again that's the thing with the dog. It's more like here's some volunteer opportunities. Learn about what's happening in your community, you know. Um, and so what happened was at that point Ariana Huffington uh, introduced uh, you know some people to us because she liked what we were doing. And the next thing you know, we're building an entire platform for AARP called Create the Good, which just launched on September 11th. So AARP came to us and said, hey, you know, we we want to engage people with volunteerism. We believe that, you know, and, 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 our, and again, when you think of AARP, you think your grandma, <laughs> you think your grandparents, you know, it's like the minute you turn 50, it's like, oh my God, I'm really old. I mean, no one, you know, and there's, so there's consensus, very few people like being that age and go, wow, I'm really now that old and now I have to, you know, uh, I'm not young anymore and so why should I have this, this association with AARP? So AARP's like said, hey, um, we want to... <coughs> have a, a, a good relationship with boomers, their kids, and their kids' kids. And and give them opportunities for them to be able to do things together. So they came to Coscast, and Coscast was able to, the, the technology and the tools that we already built, we were able to uh, extend to them and build what would be their, you know, the Create the Good campaign. Um, and working closely with them in doing that. 
So all of a sudden, what we thought was just part of our model just evolved, you know, just sort of evolved into another part of the business, which was like strategic development, becoming more of actually an, an agency in a way, a cause agency. Because all of a sudden, we kind of knew what we were talking about with social media. And all of a sudden, Twitter came on the scene, right? How many people here use Twitter? How do you, what, what do you use it for? Um, staying updated on friends and, and uh, organizations. Okay. Do you get news from it? Yeah. Would you say that you, you use it more to get news aggregated to you by the individual? Mm -hmm. Or do you actually use it just to keep up with, say, friends, basically, I'm having a cup of coffee and life's good? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> kind of both, but okay. I'm not And eventually, at a certain point, do you think it's going to get old to hearing your friends going, hey, I'm here at the quad and, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there's a level of, the, of it, like, you know, I mean, are we, a level of narcissism sometimes. It, 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 we're going to hit, I, I think that what we're going to do is we're going to evolve into a thing where this is just noise. I think we've already started to, to hit that, where a lot of this messaging and advertising and brand, it's just so, easy. like, I mean, when you, when you come to a website, what ironic is actually, you look, you know, we've got, I don't know if you know this, but there's studies where actually exactly where your eyeballs go, and it actually heats up the screen based on the movements of your eyes. So we're able to tell exactly color, we're able to tell exactly what's appealing and what's not on the screen. And most of people's actually go bang left. I don't know if anybody knew that. But again, you know, this is why when you see a lot of websites, a lot of the bigger content stuff stays on the left-hand side. Um, so anyway, is it, is it sound working? Or no? <coughs> Maybe? What's uh, is it working? Um, I will get it working. Never mind. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, so it, it, it um, so again, can I guess one of the questions is can these can can a business like Coscast and like you know I'm wearing you know Tom shoes. Anyone knows Tom shoes? Tom shoes. You know, you're familiar with the model, the one for one model. What's interesting about that, you know, we work closely with Blake, and Blake's sort of you know a close friend, and it's amazing how he discovered this model by accident. I mean, he was just he just what he said is like there's there's this. There's something in the world that needs to be corrected, and I'm going to correct it. And I believe that the tools of capitalism can be used to do that. Because really how businesses and governments change and the people is through your dollar, the purchasing dollar. You will choose to support a brand or not based on what they do in the world. If you don't care, you don't care, and that's fine. That's, you know, that's what we live in. If we live in a free country, and it, or what we think is a free country, or what you think is a free country, I mean, it's depending on how, how constricted you think is what's free. You know, if you're looking at... You know, it's really tough to for to get a job, and if, you know, with inflation and medical, it, like, is I mean, again, what is what is freedom to you? So that that's based on your own individual uh, ideology. But again, Tom, you know, Tom's shoes was was the one to one model is something that he felt that if you can actually connect to a child in need, that you're going to be more apt to buy these shoes than not. That you're going there's going to be this connection in place. Can there be a connection between businesses and doing well, and also showing how they can actually and showing how they can do well? So again, Coscast, one of these companies that is able to is is you know we feel that with not only the brands that we're going to be involved with with running cause marketing campaigns, but also with you know promoting. Is ready? Okay. Uh, with um, you know a lot of the you know again people needing exposure in the right way within one community. Is what we're doing. So I can try it. Give it a shot. Okay, give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> so so so. so all right. So. Um, let's see. Um, no. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's go. <laughs> By the way, the uh, we're Costcast is relaunching. Uh, and we should be out like in a, the, the new versions of the site. We actually, and I'll, I'll get into it in a little bit, but what we decided was right after we launched at TechCrunch 50, we realized that the, the model, the platform was not going to be sustainable with how the business was going to evolve. So what we did was we actually started building a new site, and that was 11 months ago. So right now it's in closed beta, which is, has, there's a lot more tools for the nonprofits. We listen to the nonprofits, we listen to the brands, we listen to the existing users that started coming on and started building the platform that was going to make a lot more sense. That was not going to, it was going to be like the anti, Sort of what, like it wasn't. It, it was going to be something that was you would be able to manage your cause life, and the charities can manage all their all their cause related activities online in one place. So I'll just show you the, the video that Jenny did. So. Hey guys, I'm Jenny McCarthy. In 2005, my son Evan was diagnosed with autism. 
And the day I got the diagnosis, I went home and felt confused, lost, sad, angry, and I didn't know which direction to go. So I decided to empower myself by going on the internet and trying to find as much as I could about help for my son. One of the places I found was an organization called Generation Rescue. And this organization taught me about the biomedical treatments that are recovering children from autism. After one year of implementing the biomedical treatment, Evan was recovered. I worked my ass off doing it, and now I'm so excited for something called Coscast. Yes, Evan? Um, after, after you talk, I'll give you a picture. When you, after that, you say cheese, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll do cheese. Okay, you got, you, but you got to wait until he's... Yes, but you gotta wait till he. But you gotta tell him. But you gotta wait till I'm done, and then he'll say cut. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna keep talking. Can't talk yet. I was excited to hear about what Causecast was doing because it's a way of bringing the community together that might not know about different causes to one location. So using their tools for change, Causecast makes it easy for all of us, like Generation Rescue, to be on the forefront and work together to make a difference. So join me on Causecast, and together. We will empower the world with hope, tools, and resources we need to make significant changes in the world. Thank you so much. Kevin, <laughs> you got that? Perfect. So again, you can see how a video, you know, as, as Jenny, like, and, and what's amazing about that video is like, you know, that, the, that was just sort of, in a way, magical because her, she's talking about her recovering her son from autism. And here he is with the camera. He was the second director in that video. We actually that some of that footage you see is his, you know. And then I bought you know I bought him a, a little uh, little flip cam, and then Jenny's like she's he's addicted to it. And next thing you know he's making videos and stuff. So um, yeah, uh, it, it's one of these things where exactly when when people see something like that, what do you, now what do you do? You want to you want to potentially support Jenny? You want to support Generation Rescue? You want to look into more? How do you how do you find out more information? So again, we feel by having one place where all this can live and promoting it adequately, you know, using the social web. Now remember, there's a lot of, like I was saying, there's a lot of noise out there. I mean, Twitter is like going and walking in a room with a bullhorn and screaming at the top of your lungs, you're there with thousands of other people. And the fact is, is that people are going to follow and endorse and support brands and companies and people and individuals that are aggregating and vetting stuff for you. That's the new web. That's where we're going. You know, it's 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 about what is how are you know what exactly are you going to get from the internet and how can actually it, it, it work for you in terms of people? Whether it's Guy Kawasaki who's going to give you some good tech information, whether or it's Steve Case, the founder of AOL, is talking about new business models, or it's or or it's someone like like whether it's Causecast delivering cause news from around the world, or it's Huffington Post. Again, Twitter delivers that to you and also you know in, in the form of people or companies. Coscast does this in the form of actually all everything caused around the world that we'll be reporting that you can't find that won't be on that won't be on NPR or CNN or or BBC. And if it is, or or the New York Times, and if it is, you're you're gonna you'll be able to you'll be able to link out to it longer than a day. Because there's no reason why you should actually know about, you know, two million people that have been, you know, murdered in Congo. In Africa's longest running war for something that's called conflict minerals. Who's familiar with conflict minerals? One, two, good. No one else knows what conflict minerals are. So, so 60 Minutes is doing is doing a report now. Uh, it will be I don't know when. I think it hopefully it's going to be out in in a month of something called conflict minerals. Conflict minerals, the, the longest running war in Africa, in that has killed two two million people and millions more men and women have been serially raped because of minerals that go into your cell phone and your computers. The demand for technology is fueling the need for stuff that's going into every one of our personal, our, our gadgets, right? And so John Pendergast, who, who partnered with Don uh, Sheedle and Not On Our Watch, has basically said, I'm gonna educate people about conflict minerals. Now here, now he got Emil Hirsch to join him. He's got a lot of these celebrities together, but still, you won't know about it. It's not unless 60 Minutes does this thing and someone talks about it again. It's like there's like, wow, look at all these. How can you figure out what you're going to be able to do? So what Causecast is now going to be able to do is, like Twitter and like Facebook, you'll be able to customize 
not only the causes that you, that you want to support, but maybe ones that you don't know. Inherently, we believe, and this is our credo, cause guess who believes all causes are connected. It's like, it's not like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. But it, there's something to the, you know, the fact, the, the uh, fact, how factory farming is connected to a health issue, which is connected to an environmental issue, which is connected to an animal rights issue, which is then all of a sudden now become an environmental issue. So, wow, all these, so basically everyone's in the, is, is in the same business, right? If, if we know, for example, that the cattle industry is responsible for most of the methane gas, which actually is much more potent for global warming, then the CO2, then that's like sort of like the big thing with the green movement. It's like, oh, you know, you know, drive a hybrid. And I'll tell you right now, you know, a meat eater on a bike is like 10 times more dangerous than an actually vegetarian in a Hummer. <laughs> then that's statistics. The United Nations came out with these stats. You don't know that. How do you know that? Where do you get that information? Again, Causecast, we believe the model that people are going to be looking for this stuff. And not only going to be looking for this stuff, they're going to want to be engaged with it. And they're going to, and, and more of the charities and the brands and corporate social responsibility and the CEOs are going to come in and go, hey, we're going to support these businesses that they're going to go to. And what we're going to do is then we're going to actually crowdsource it. We're going to let people vote on how these businesses are doing. We're going to let them chime in. We're going to let the public be aware of actually and let full transparency happen because that's what the internet can be great at. You know, that was the, it's, it's interesting. You look at a lot of, you know, uh, when you looked at what happened in Iran and you looked at what happened with, you know, what happens in China and you look at happened in the liberties that we have here that sometimes we take, we take for granted. But again, we have the ability to get in, to not only get information, but be able to have the ability to decipher what is really true about that information, how it gets to us. So. Now, could you talk a little bit about the revenue model, where you got the money to develop this, and how you keep it going? Um, yeah, the revenue model for, well, the, the actual cause cast is funded by a round of, of angel investors that believed in that a site like Causecast can be viable because people, that brands uh, will run campaigns that will be able to support the model of, of an entire company putting out this type of content. Again, like I said, it's, it's not exactly the first thing that people are looking for, but because, it's a, because of the relevancy and the importance that brands will pay to be involved in cause marketing, which is a business that went from you know, $1 billion to $2 billion in a year in terms of the, 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 the spend that uh, companies are getting involved with. So it's a new emerging market, the cause marketing industry. Um, how it's going to be sustainable, is that, is that the second part of your question? Um, as I said before, what we thought when we first built it is the business plan went right out the window. Um, if you were to tell me like any advertising, basically like even VCs will tell you, you give a business plan with advertising being the number one revenue. And that's actually ironically, if there's 40 different revenue streams for a company, YouTube has one, right? And they still can't keep up. And basically any VC will say they'll throw the business plan right out the window or put it at the bottom of the pile if it's just advertising. Advertising is not sustainable and the, and the model's changing anyway. The banner ad, please. I mean, that was like 1996. I mean, we have to think about how effective we can be with advertising now. So what's happening is that we're looking at user engagement. So, so, so companies are now paying for the ability to have a user get involved with some of the charities and the nonprofits celebrity and brand, and then go maybe one <coughs> to 11 steps of being involved in the process. So what Coscast is going to do is bring that, that, is going to bring that 360 model, which is where, which is kind of from the music thing, and then of course Kiva does a great job of this, but showing exactly how you were involved, what your impact was, and here's the person that's, that you, for the person or cause that, you, that, that was uh, benef benefited from your interact interaction. And we believe that, that Brands will pay and pay well for that uh, to be involved. So we've already vetted all the nonprofits. We are able to we have taken on the liability to pay out those monies to them and have vetted them to the public, um, and have done that and that and built that process. So even though this is a dot org, it's a private company, and your investors expect a return on investment. It's well, even it's a dot org. The dot org is actually a marketing tactic. Uh, <laughs> Dot org being, you know, again, nobody really knows. Well, they kind of think it's like nonprofit, but they don't really know that. So we, we took the risk of going, we're going to promote it as a dot org and not a dot com. Most people make the mistake and default to a dot com. But the Coscast, Coscast is a corporation. It is a business that's meant to be sustainable and if not profitable. And not only profitable, but potentially does it get acquired? And do, do, does, does one of the bigger companies that haven't been able to do this 
buy Coscast because they were able, they believe that there's a market that are looking at people that are that want to change the world. Does it become does it become an acquisition target? Does it become uh, do, do we start rolling up other companies and going, listen, you're not running your business effectively. We found a new way to do it. Let's start acquiring other companies that are in this space and be able to create one large platform with users that will be able to to be able to for people to interact. And then I think the the, the interesting uh, part about this is can capitalism be used to create social good? And we believe yes. Not only believe yes, but we're, 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 we're putting our money where our mouth is and going that people will support us on this journey. Um, and having the numbers and the nonprofit partners and the celebrities and the brands to be able to prove that. Um, so now, you know, uh, um, you know, we're, we're launching some big partnerships soon with the Huffington Post. We've already been, you know, as I said, we launched for AARP, the Create the Good platform, um, and you know, with the whole, with with the, we actually did, and we're actually launching a uh, uh, texting service where people can actually make a donation using their cell phone bill. So with a hundred percent pass through to the actual charity. Um, part of the business model is that because it's a high, it's, it, it, we were able to get the, the, the carriers to waive all their fees. We're still in order to process that to the ASP. We're able to take a little bit of that percentage. So Shakira is launching it with you know next month with us, and again you know we'll be able you know the the small transaction fee will be able to cover our costs um, and employees that are actually handling it for it. So it 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 will eventually be able to give back to the to Coscast if it, if again it scales and we have a lot of charities and a lot of celebrities start using it, and it's you know like uh, within a year or two. So these are these <coughs> things that we're able to kind of create and we can to sort of keep to keep the business going. Um, Do you want but, to but again, yeah, I, I, I just, sorry, I talked for a while. Um, I, I, I was, was, yeah, um, I, uh, I thank you for having me here. I hope I was, just was, you know, it was, uh, it was educational for everybody and, and, uh, um, I was able to, I'm going to open up for questions, but thank you. Um, what, how did you go about selecting your team to get started and what were kind of the strengths that you brought to the table and how did you fill the gaps of like things that you weren't so good at or, you know, skills that you didn't have? Mm, question. Um, we we started by uh, with the initial team of, of of getting great referrals from people, going you need to meet so and so, or you know when we started to find a need of what we needed, what the company needed to uh, to build, like oh oh wow we needed an office manager because you know um, you know we need somebody to run the office, and we we, we started. We didn't, it was like, in the business plan, it didn't get built out exactly what we thought we needed. We allowed it, we, we were able to be flexible enough to go within a month by month basis to, to three months, and then six months, who do we think we're going to need? And then we would fill it based on that need, because what happens, especially with tech, you know, with tech startups, <coughs> is that you staff because of what you think you need, and someone's just sitting around kind of twiddling their thumb because you were six months late with development. So we wanted to basically make sure we hired, that we, we were able to, uh, you know, make sure that that person had a, a role that they were able to significantly fit that we were not We didn't have excessive burn at that point. Um, we hired internally, so a lot of people actually were interns that worked for us, and then we're like, you're doing great at this, continue on. You want a job? So we empowered people by, by working at Coscast, and then we were, we were saying, you know, we have, a, we, have a, we have a saying at Coscast, which is called manage up, that we don't keep, we treat people like children, we believe that they're capable of doing things and being able to be free thinkers, and just with a, with a bit of guidance from what you need, that you'll be able to come and problem solve. It is a lot of pressure for a lot of people, especially when they, if they're coming out of school or they have a couple of years and don't really have the experience. But there's no better way to get experience than to do it. You know, Ryan did it, and I did it. And then sort of what we do is we surround ourselves with people that, that know things that we don't. You surround yourself up with, with better, smarter people. You know, I think I'm smart. Nowhere near as smart as my lawyer. Or nowhere near as smart as my, you know, some of the PR people because of PR. Nowhere near as smart as, as smart of um, people that handle the grassroots marketing efforts of the company, or or our developers, uh, you know. Again, I don't, I don't, I know enough, but I don't know um, what they know. So what I do is I empower them to make the company better. If that answers your question. Okay. What's what's your vetting process like for selecting organizations on the board? Uh, good question. We actually the vetting process is we look at. Their financials, their 990s. We look at what they're doing on the internet and see if they've embraced social media or understand it. Are they going to be easy or hard to work with? We look at GuideStar. We look at Charity Navigator. Um, we look at what their. I, I, I guess it would be what. 
what work they've been doing in the field and how they could be able to utilize our, our strategic thinking and our tools to be able to, to help them. Um, we have right now on the platform 60 vetted nonprofits. There's about 150 that are in queue. And what we're going to be doing in the next version is that we're going to have, there are going to be ones that are featured, but we're opening up the entire platform. And also, Coscast takes 0% of the transaction. So we believe that part of our model, because we don't want to, our model is not to make money off of nonprofits from online transactions. So we'll take, we, there'll be a credit card transaction fee, which hopefully we'll get a brand to sponsor, but we'll take 0% of that transaction. And we believe that if charities take our fundraising widget, which will be, you know, people can actually donate through that, who, you know, and the charity can actually be like, oh, do I go through Convio, Network for Good, or Coscast, and you're able to see, kind of like Orbitz, who you want to donate from, you know, you can choose to go to your donation through, you know, maybe any of these different platforms. So we believe that actually people might want to donate to Coscast because, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you an interesting statistic and I'll uh, keep the companies and the nonprofits uh, confidential. But when the tsunami happened, one very large company that handles financial transactions for nonprofits reaped about a $50 million profit. All right? $50 million profit. Gave zero of that back. I mean, I'm just, I mean, that, that pisses me off. Sorry, I'm just going to be um, a New Yorker, I'm a little blunt. But when that pisses, but it pisses me off, you know, it, you know, and it pisses Ryan off, we want to do something about it. So what we're going to do something about it is we're going to actually build something and go, all right, we don't care if you think it's, this is going to work or not. We don't even think, we think that charities are going to want this. And we're going to be, and we're going to be transparent about it. And if you want to fight, let's fight. Let, let, the, free, let the free markets decide, as we say. And, let, and the free markets will support the companies that actually will, that uh, people want to use their platform. If you want to make a donation on Coscast, because if we take 0% and you think it's better, then great. If you don't, you don't. I mean, and again, you just have to build the best infrastructure and hopefully the market will respond to it. So that's what we, that's what we continue to do. And we spend every day figuring out with our team, how do we make it better? What can we do for nonprofits that they're not already doing? Um, Coscast, um, happy, you know, this would be, um, is this going live? Is that live? I can announce this now. So Coscast will be the first company that will be able to provide home phone billing to nonprofits. It will be the only company that's allowed to do this. We're going to be in 143 million households in the United States with no credit card. So you can actually take your home phone bill and make a donation up to $500 a month on monthly. And we're going to build that into our platform. No one else has that. It's an experimentation. AT&T, Verizon, all these big companies waive their fees to do that. So we started something called Charity Conference Hall, which actually pays out. This is interesting. You guys are going to like this. So you can make a call a conference call, it's like free conference call, but instead of the money going to me, it goes to charity. How does this happen? Well, it's kind of like telecom pork. <coughs> Seriously, it's pork for the telecom industry. So in order to keep jobs in certain states, the big carriers pay a fee to drive traffic to local states. So the Coscast conference call goes to Minnesota. Minnesota pays a finder's fee for the inbound call traffic. Inbound call traffic goes to charity conference call, right, for us for the finder's fee. And you were able to support six nonprofits through all your conference calls. So half a penny per minute per user. So if you actually have now an hour, so Shakira, I could put a, a Shakira concert online for an hour. She could talk for an hour and people can call in. And if I have 50,000 people listening for one hour on the call bridge, she just, just, on a, just, we, just we just raised some significant money just by doing nothing. So again, this is another idea of like, you know, just like, of like what I like to do in my spare time. You know, so it, it's a good, how do you provide this sort of, these solutions to, you know, again, to modern problems um, and being creative about it. So, I, I'm sorry I strayed from the answering the question of the vetting, but I just wanted to like get a little bit more into sort of like well, how we're trying to solve some of these problems and then making it available to all nonprofits. Yes? Um, how do you benchmark and measure your social impact? Good question. Um, well, there's a couple things. One is uh, traffic which is, of course, if an article gets read or it gets dug or if um, people start, you know, we, you know, we have an entire little, we have a, it's, it's a, five people in the social media department, what they do is they're able to track um, through different articles how many times it gets, uh, whether it's stumbled or dug or read, um, we're able to sort of, you know, we, we quantify that, you know, uh, how many views a video gets. So I'll give you an example, like the, we did a video for uh, focus features for Harvey Milk when the movie came out, and it was very much like um, Harvey's speech with a lot of text. And, you know, uh, Perez picked it up. And eventually got like close to like a million views. And people were like, oh my god, you did that video? 
So I can say, yeah, it was successful as a viral video because we had close to a million views for a video that, that took us, you know, 10 minutes to make. And we've been spending like, you know, a year plus doing this thing, where none, some of the other videos have nowhere near that sort of impact, right? Um, and I can go, hey, we were able to raise $20,000 from this initiative or this article. Again, you know, those, there's some hard numbers, some really hard quantifiable numbers, and then there's the intangible, which has to do with awareness. So I think that we're, what, we're, what we've begun to work on is being able to, uh, there's a, a, a process that we filed a patent for that I really can't discuss so much, but it, it really, it has specifically for volunteerism numbers, and then of course for uh, how many people, whether they donate or take some sort of action online. Now the problem with this, especially with the donation, is that social media is still not good for donations. For the amount of people that are online, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's pretty much like a failure. Um, you know, and everyone's out there now talking about their cause. Actually, I think it's, it's with everyone has cause overload, to be quite honest with you. If another friend, because I get all, you know, again, because I, I, I support all these causes on Facebook, it's like I go crazy because I get an email update every time the charity sends out, and they don't know how to use these tools properly. So what happens is every day I get 20 e emails from nonprofits talking about polar bears are dying, the world's ending, you know, cleft lip, you know, like go down the line. And, then, and the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm kind of having a little fun with this because the fact is, is that, it, you know, I'm showing you how numb we're going to all get if you don't use these things properly. So um, we're trying to work a way to like, what is, what is real, met, like really quantifiable metrics that be able to go back and go, a million people watched this video, we were able to raise X amount of money for donations, it got retweeted X amount of times, it got stumbled, it got dug, um, you know, and some things aren't just going to go. I mean, some people, people just don't want to listen to doom and gloom, or they're not going to want to care about floods in India. So how do you actually take something like that that happens in India and actually put it in a way where people can actually feel some sort of engagement? So we're working on trying to come up with the best ways to show not only our partners, but also uh, brands in the space, the celebrities, the impact of what they're doing online and how it makes a difference, whether it's specific quantified, whether it's a dollar amount, or that so many people read this article. So hence the Huffington Post partnership where we're able to like, you know, we're able to get millions of views on something, but it might get like five retweets, or it might get 10 comments, or 100 comments. Again, I don't know, it just, it just depends on the type of content. But, um, you know, how effectively we do will be looking at a lot of those numbers and being able to learn from them very quickly and educate the nonprofits and educate the people that are involved in the campaign how they're going about uh, working with those numbers to be able to improve them. So, um, you know, a lot of places it's business as usual. And I don't like that. I mean, it's kind of like there's all these issues and if we can move the needle a little bit, then we've all done our job. I don't I think a lot of this stuff's solvable. I think it's solvable with people's money. I think it's been solvable with people support brands and brands will support issues. You can solve, there's, there's a lot of things that we can solve just by, you know, changing our habits and what we know. You know what I mean? I mean, the environment is one thing that people know about, but still don't, you know, some people just don't do things about it. They're very, we're very hard, we resist change. I, I don't understand why, because everything is change. It's weird, it's strange. Any, yes? Yeah, uh, how much of uh, like the future success on like, the site do you feel will depend on like, celebrity interaction? Um, good question, I think it's, I think it's gonna be, uh, it's less than, than what we initially anticipated. If you, part of our original business model was that celebrities drive traffic. So let's talk, let's talk business. Um, celebrities drive traffic and there's eight, so Jenny would be like, there's an A list, B list, C list, D list in terms of actually what people are, not in terms of where they are in the celebrity list, but in terms of actually how many, like, uh, like this Jennifer Lopez, what does that mean for traffic? And you could actually quantify how many people are searching for Jennifer Lopez or how many people are searching for Jenny McCarthy or how many people are searching for Matthew Modine or Maggie Q or whatever. And then we would, we, we, Quantify that by basically like how many, how many people are looking for them, and then what is that percentage of people would be actually caring about the cause that they would do? And then we took that number, and we actually said this is actually how people are going to be looking for that information. So, um, and then we we thought that that was going to scale up with the more celebrities that came on board, and then we get more traffic. More traffic would mean more ad revenue. More avenue, ad revenue would mean more dollars. More dollars would mean more staffing and better valuation of the company. So. We, um, you know, again, we thought about the, the celebrity interaction because, again, people were like, well, you're just a celebrity website for celebrities to preach what kind of causes they're of, which are going to just help their own brand. And, you know, I, you, 
we try to be very careful about that because there are a lot of people that will just show up at an event, you know, and like, oh, they care about this, they care about that. I think it was, anyone see Bruno? Mm -hmm. There was a thing where he's like, you know, what, what's hot? And they're like, oh, well, children in Africa are hot. You know, there's a whole thing where he's going to these, these, these charity advisors who are going, well, he wants to, and it's the whole thing is that he needs to have a charity song. In the end, of course, he sings with Bono and Elton John. But it's like, the, it was, you know, this thing about like, you know, how do you, you know, is, is it for real for them or is it, or is it, is it something that is, um, you know, or people just looking for press stuff? So we, when we got into it, we thought it was going to be much more uh, powerful than, than uh, um, and much more important than what it is currently. So we've actually, we've actually removed leaders on the new site. We've taken it off. Uh, people are just going to be people and it's going to be what they're doing in the world and actually, I mean, and let the crowd, and let the public comment and vote them up and do judge them for who they are as opposed to putting people on a pedestal. So we learned that and we made the change appropriate in the appropriate way. Anything else? Any other? Cool. Uh, Last question. Uh, uh, how much do you want to see calls guys on other different platforms? Like, how many see there's a ton of users on Facebook and Twitter? Mm -hmm. How much of, do you want the, their, your content being pushed to those? And do you see that as being able to help build cost gas as far as your users or um, helping the actual interaction on the site? Yeah, I mean, again, good question. I think that we, of course, we want to use you know people that are on existing these the platform. Remember, they, these are tools. I mean, they're not like, at the end of the day. Facebook is a great tool for you to be able to to, to manage your sort of social life and your calendar. Uh, Twitter is a good way to aggregate news and information. Um, following sometimes when, when your friends are having a, a coffee, but um, the you know Coscast when, when you hit this sort of saturation point of noise, what's going to happen is the Marshall McLuhan uh, factor is what I call it. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with McLuhan, no one's familiar with Marshall McLuhan. Oh, I know you are. Um, everyone should read Understanding Media here. Marshall McLuhan basically predicted the internet before there was the internet. And he came up with Timothy Leary and Ram Das and talked about how, you know, what Seth Godin talks about and Mark Malcolm Gladwell will talk about now modernly about tribes and how things are kind of forming as we become a global society. Uh, we it's about our interests that draw us together. So within Facebook, Facebook's like this, it's another planet. It's like one of the one of the most populated countries in, in the world, Facebook. Um, so again, people are going to be, if, you know, to, to really be looking to get involved with causes and we've seen a rise in social consciousness and corporate social responsibility. A platform like Causecast becomes very appealing that expounds upon that inter that that experience, where you're able to uh, do some of the things you do that you can't do in Facebook because that's just the construct of the of the platform. It's not built for that. Causes is an actual is is an app is an actual app on the Causecast platform, but it can only do so much. There's certain rules that can be bent, and there's, you know, and it only, and it only, so, and it, it can only go so far. So, Coscast, we're like, we're really taking it to the next level. That you're going to actually come from Facebook, you're going to come from MySpace, you're going to come from it, and you're going to look for a much cleaner, better, more, you know, engaging experience with people that are doing very similar things in the world that you want to interact with, or causes that you didn't know, you didn't know were were happening, and or companies that you didn't know what they were doing. So that gets driven by content. And content's the driver. Con you know, the user experience is another driver. So there's three metrics. There's like there's traffic, there's the user experience, um, and and from the you know from the traffic and the user experience is then that you can be able to generate the third, which is just these, is the you know revenue. So um, we feel that those things from those existing big, those platforms will be able to um, you know build organically what will be uh, you know will be a platform that people would want to use. Because again, there's an interesting photo, and then I'll end, of the, the top 20 websites and what they started when they launched and what they look like, mm -hmm. and it was really funny. Mm -hmm. So we're just, again, we're just gonna, we're just gonna do the best we can. We're gonna listen. We, you know, we got a great team of people that are looking to like really change the world and believe they can use their, you know, their, their, whether it's their skill, whether they have an MBA. We hired, we actually just brought, we just hired a, uh, a someone from USC <laughs> Business School. Uh, to do business development for us right out of school and I said here we need models build them we have these deals to be done come on let's do it and again you just you just you know you just jumped right in you know and he and he's learning and you know and learning about like sort of 
you know, how we're, how we're approaching things. Again, because there's, you know, wis you can have knowledge and you can have wisdom, but once you do it, individuals are individuals. So what we do is we believe in the individual and, they're, and giving them the opportunity, everyone has the ability to shine. You know what I mean? It, it's, and uh, certain people will step up to the plate and Coscast is a place that we allow that to happen because it's not, we're not just doing one thing, we're doing something we believe is something special. And people that really fight to stay uh, to work at Coscast. Well, I'll, one, one, I'll end with this. We had a, uh, an, an intern that works that actually now works with us now, who does product. Who, well, he was an intern. He worked at Deloitte. He was making six figures a year. He drove two and a half hours a day to work at Coscast for free, for three months, and begged and fought and worked 15 hours a day, seven days a week, to force us to hire him because he wanted to change his life and he believed that actually by changing his life he could actually even change the world because the world needed to be a better place and he wanted to like marry his girlfriend and, have him, and, he, did, and he felt that he, he just wanted to like do something. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. So, anyway. Thank you. fundraising event that Coscast was hosting for an organization called I Live Here and uh, across a, a dark room I shouted, would you come talk to our students? And Brian shouted back, I would be honored. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that everyone joined me in saying that we are honored to have you here today and we really want to thank you very much for your time no, and wish you the best of luck for your organization. Everyone sign up for I hope, I hope I hope everyone got something out of this and, and that um, again I look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks again. Appreciate it. So today we talked about the topic, uh, can social media save the world? Our next Lunch and Learn is October 21st, and we'll be looking at can organic farming change the world? Um, please take your cup with you, that's yours to keep, trash in the back, and thank you guys very much for coming today. Pleasure. Really? It's good. Yeah.